Today, I'm going to be talking about why protecting vulnerable road users is just as beneficial to the police as it is to the community. Um, and it should be particularly helpful to those that struggle mainly to get um, their local forces to work with them, either on infrastructure projects or modal shift. And just some ideas you can use and share with your local police force um, and, you know, sort of steer them in the right direction. Um, and why, you know, th there's a great benefit to police forces in encouraging mode shift, in particular active travel, which I'll talk about uh, from experiences that uh, I and my own force have had. But I'll do a quick introduction first that they don't know me. Uh, those who have had the pleasure of hearing me speak before, I do apologise um, for boring you previously. Um, I am a police officer. I am a traffic officer. Um, I've been in the police now for 22 years. I've been in a traffic officer for 15. Um, 11 of those years of traffic I spent as a 24-7 traffic officer, like you see on the TV. Um, three years on the West Midlands Road Harm Prevention Team, and now I've been on a core motorway world for one year. Um, probably what separates me and uh, the person I did a lot of my work with, Steve Hudson, is, is that we were traffic officers very interested in um, what I call, call traffic work and really reducing demand. Um, so a lot of what we did, you know, and still do has a selfish aspect to it as police officers in that we are all interested in doing less work and ways of doing that. Um, but we found that by promoting uh, modal shift and active travel, we could lessen our own workload uh, greatly, as you'll find out as I, as I carry on talking. Um, first of all, we'll look at why protecting vulnerable road users is just as beneficial to the police as it is to the community. And it's about, for the police, demand reduction. Um, it's a very big buzzword in the police at the moment, demand reduction. Um, doing you know more with less has been what we've been faced with since 2012 and the cuts that uh, the government brought into you know the police service obviously there's been a lot of news around slashing 20 off 20,000 officers and backroom staff and so traffic police in particular which is very expensive by its nature equipment and training wise took a big hit um when you look at vulnerable road use and what demand it puts upon the police uh, regards resources and time allocated to it. it it's very little um and me as a traffic officer i don't get calls you know about vulnerable road users causing issues on the roads um, and causing incidents that i have to attend more importantly um uh, road traffic collision demand wise is, is a hugely expensive incident to attend for a police force resources follow up I mean, you've only got to look at the departments we have when it all goes wrong to understand the costs involved when you have uh, departments dedicated to, you know, investigating serious and road traffic uh, collisions that basically carry the same sort of resources as murder investigation teams. Um, the hours involved are very expensive and the expense of the rest of the community. So for every person that we get out of a car and onto another form of transport, um, it's one less car that I have to worry about on a daily basis, especially at peak times and demands. The other thing is, is when you get people out of cars um, and into uh, other forms of transport, especially active travel, is you have eyes and ears everywhere. So you get a trickle down effect of it, it reduces other police demand as well. The more people you have out on the streets and not in cars, walking around, cycling, the more people you have that are basically our crime deterrent. Um, the one thing criminals don't like is they don't like being seen, they don't like being heard. Um, and it really is a case of safety in numbers, both when it comes to vulnerable transport you know, users and the general public being victims of crime. The more people there is around um, actually looking and doing rather than stuck inside a metal box where they're oblivious to everything that goes on outside of them. Um, the harder it is for people to, to commit crime. So the, the more people you have using active transport, whether that's walking, whether it's cycling, whether you know, whether it's on a scooter, whatever your preference is, it becomes hugely beneficial to the police as a result. Um, and these are the things that people forget. And what you need to realise is, is that 
we suffer, you know, unconscious bias and transport prejudices every day. People who, you know, use vulnerable road um, transport types. But the police force is a cross section of the community. So you will get um, those same, you know, sort of un unconscious bias traits and prejudices in, in police forces. You've got to really make it attractive to them you know to, to support a scheme or to support a certain transport type and by pointing out these little things um it can help greatly um i mean to give you an example if you look at say um when a football ground empties um and you suddenly got up to forty thousand people spilling out onto the streets around you have an immediately pedestrianized area um the one thing that police forces uh, you know panic about is demand is this going to cause me uh, you know as an organization more demand am i going to have to allocate resources to it when those forty thousand people spill out onto the roads around a football ground um, in a totally uncoordinated fashion with no infrastructure and you get total pedestrianization of the roads around there albeit only for 15 minutes nobody ever gets hurt even though there's lots of people walking around um, because it is a case of safety in numbers and that's what you really need to, you know as a police force you need to encourage um if you want to reduce demand around travel especially active travel and there's ways of doing that and i mean we've done lots of ways you know sort of um of encouraging if you look at the things that we've had in the west midlands like mode shift stars clean air zones coming in elsewhere in the country you've got congestion charges you've got infrastructure projects um bike hire schemes scooter hire schemes anything like this is something that really if, you, if you're going to police smart and police from an evidence-based perspective, things that you should really be saying the right things around and you, you can almost, you know, sort of make uh, cost neutral to the police, you know, sort of all cost benefit, you know, demand wise, we just saying and doing the right things with very little resources. If you look um, around some of the things that we've done operation wise, and I'll, I will come back, I promise, and talk about some of these things in greater detail if people need. Um, but things like Operation Close Pass, which is the one that's probably always widely known, um, 21 hour enforcement that we, we started doing, Operation Zigzag, which was around pedestrian casualties at vulnerable locations, um, Operation Safe for Schools, Operation Park Safe, you know, I could go on and on third party reporting. They all really didn't take many police resources at all. Um, and as a result, we saw significant reductions in demand around our KSI rates and bits and pieces like that. So the, the main, you know, sort of theme of what I'm trying to say is that really, if you can get on board with your local police force, you know, sort of, um, supporting whatever infrastructure you know you want in place and even with the infrastructures in place or you know whether it's a modal shift scheme whether it's something like mode shift stars at schools you've got to really make them realize the demand reduction um just another good example around mode shift stars at schools every school in the country has a terrible parking problem um, everywhere I've ever worked, every school on every patch I've ever worked, there's always a parking issue, you know, for 20 minutes either side. If you, you know, have, a, you know, a modal shift scheme and you have less people driving their kids to school, um, you don't have the demand regards those parking complaints then from residents, the problem goes away. And then you have less demand because you've got all those people walking to school at key times, children are you know very vulnerable when it comes to being victims of crime um and so you've got more people back on the streets like i said and you get a crime deterrence as well so it's a win-win situation all around um and then from there you you move on to policing infrastructure now and i know there are a great many people who have joined us today who are involved in infrastructure projects and for the police it's really about um when you have an infrastructure project it is you know it's the holy grail isn't it you know in dedicated infrastructure you're going to separate your transport types you're going to take away the majority of the risk but for that infrastructure to work you've got to have a policing plan in place and it's not around the infrastructure that 
and it's infrastructure will never go from somebody's front door to wherever they what they are going you know you'll always have good infrastructure but you'll always have those parts of a journey where you're going to have to mix it with drivers and it's important that if your infrastructure is going to work and the police and the local community are going to get the benefits from that infrastructure you've really got to work on that you know how they they access it and so just as an example, when we had the Blue Roots in Birmingham, uh, before the Blue Roots even opened, we looked long and hard about who was going to be using them, where they were coming from, where they would filter along to get onto the Blue Roots, um, and how we we're going to police it, and how we were going to basically keep them safe so they could access the infrastructure and then use the infrastructure and, as you know, in have more people using the infrastructure and reduce our demand as a result in the police. And so we looked at more like 20 mile enforcement, you know, around the areas that fed onto the infrastructure um, and uh, you know again running operation close pass operations you know on those same things but uh, as with everything what I, is key is the media has to be right I, I can do a lot of work and if the right people don't know about it um, and the right partners don't know about it and they don't spread the message as well um, it, it's time wasted for me um, so whatever you know we do or the police forces that you work with the message has got to be right it's got to be put in the right place and the people whose behaviors you're trying to change which will be those who endanger your vulnerable road users um, they're the ones you've got to get it to so you've got to put that message in the right place and the kind of work that we did it was really about you know finding those right places and at times you know getting a fair bit of negative comments back um but we often took the view that there's no such thing as a negative comment when it comes to traffic policing you just get a reaction you get a reaction and you get as a result the desired effect because they then take on board what you're doing they become aware and unless they're aware that they don't change their behavior um and somebody who you know reacts we often say without reaction there's no traction um it is somebody who will then, next time they're in a car, if they've made a fuss on social media, writing letters for a paper about it, next time they're in their car, they will then be thinking about it. It's the forefront of their brains. And, and that's basically how it works uh, with policing vulnerable road use. It's one of those things that has such great benefit to the community and can also reduce police demand in other ways. Um, if you look at the amount of mental health issues that the police have to deal with, um, on a daily basis anything such as active travel which improves mental health and can just take away a bit of that burden from communities and emergency services again is something that we really should promote and, and protect really as an organization and so we look to really just um this is one of the things i talk about when i talk to all the forces it is view transport especially active travel and modal shift in, in, in a different way that we traditionally have done um as police officers as something that you can put a bit of time of effort into not a lot of cost but if you get it right you can reduce your own demand regards our crime demand and our demand on um dealing with uh, road traffic collisions and the demand on the community greatly you know that those things like i said like mental health that people don't associate that the people you know that the police do have to, to deal with um on a daily basis now, I know I've said a lot there and there'll be a lot of questions. And if anybody um, doesn't get what they want out of these, someone's just asked me a question, Bob has got my details and I know he'll pass them on. He's been very good as been, you know, sort of the secretariat to everything that we do um, and have done for a long time. We couldn't have done a lot of what we do without Bob. Um, and I'll just give you a quick update on Steve as well while I'm on here. Um, Steve is still involved in the police uh, at the moment, um, albeit because of his illness, not in the way that he wants to be. Um, and he says hello to everybody that knows him. Um, and hopefully we can get him on here uh, one week because he's uh, out self-isolating at home. And um, I'm sure he'd like to be involved. He's still got a lot to say. He's still just as passionate. Um, and he's still the person that keeps me in check when I, you know, sort of um, have those ideas and start bouncing them around. So there we go. Um, I don't think there's really anything else that I'd say apart from when you do talk to your police forces, just bear in mind that the one thing they're worried about is demand and back office demand. And the one thing that I will say is if, if you have any interaction with police forces and you want to point them towards me and I can then you know, way lay some of those fears about back office demand because it's always about not what you're doing, it's about what they think you're doing is important. 
um, and like I said, uh, for a, a, you know, giving out a few tickets in the right place and letting the right people know you can have a big behavioural change. And that can waylay a lot of the fears that forces have. And then when you start to evidence the other demand reductions that can have by supporting, you know, modal shift and you know, um, vulnerable road use, then you can really get them on board and you can usually find the right person as well in the organization. Somebody who's got that passion, whether it's, you know, somebody who does genuinely care about how people get around and protecting people in the community, or it's somebody who, you know, who you know, wants to make a name for himself and climb for an organization, it doesn't matter, but you know, if you can find the right person, you, you can get these things done quite easily. Um, so then, um, Bob, uh, that's basically, um, it for today but that's going to you know sort of like uh there's gonna be a few questions around that so if you want to go to questions yeah brilliant yeah just just want to say thanks mark and you're definitely welcome back here anytime uh, uh i remember in london when we had the the cycle task force and i always quote that around the country as being the changing point for everything in london when wow well, we had police officers that could attend meetings and talk through infrastructure with us so amazing the work you're doing in the, in the midlands I will say, um, I definitely want you back up, but we might have to ask answer most of the comments in the chat because uh, we've still got like a um, at least one more speaker. I'll speak to the one because we run out of time. So, Bob, I'm going to bring you in. Um, well, please be brief. Thanks. Um, uh, and please unmute yourself. <laughs> um, Okay, yeah. I just wanted to uh, ask if if Mark could just say what kind of operations are carried out because some people don't know. There's policing close passing, uh, which uh, PC Steve Hudson, who he referred to, set up with Mark, and um, uh, that started rolling out from 2016. There's also an operation on mobile phone use. There's Operation Zigzag. There's um, and there's the whole third party reporting thing. Uh, that's the kind of stuff which has happened. I don't know if Mark wants to say anything more about that now or at another date. I think you might well, just mention them all, but go for it, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly run through. It will take me a minute. And what I will say is that I can come back at any time, as long as I'm not at work, and I can do a presentation on each of these individually just to satisfy people. But I'll start with that. I'll do it chronologically. Up close past, like Bob said, 2016, it was rolled out. But we really started testing that in 2015. Um, our first third party enforcement I did in April 2014 uh, using a helmet cam from cyclists. That was, you know, seems a long time now. Um, and then Opt Zigzag is an operation around pedestrian crossings, um, which came about for some statistical analysis we did when we found out that 38% of our pedestrian KSIs happened at pedestrian crossings. And so that's how that came about. It's a very interesting um, operation, that one is. Operation Park Safe is all around parking and obstruction and um, leaving vehicles in dangerous position and how we upskill PCSOs to deal with those offences. So it was spread down to community policing level. Um, Operation Top Deck, which is the phone one, which everybody knows about on the bus, um, probably the most prolific and successful um, mobile phone operation, you know, ever uh, been adopted all over the world and, and bettered by some countries. Um, and Operation Safer Schools, which looked at um, protecting kids on the school run, whatever mo you know, form of transport they took, um, which was particularly effective in changing, um, trans you know, affecting modal shifts at school because we were that um, prolific at dealing with drivers around schools and the way they took their children to school. They stopped driving their children to school and walked instead. So they talk about the adverse effects of you know, doing things differently. But again, you know, it was a win-win all around. This time, um, I was asked to uh, do some talks on the operations that we've run over the years. And uh, Bob asked me to start with um, close pass and third pass reporting. This is going to be a chronological um, sort of thing, starting way back in 2014, believe it or not. Um, and we'll run through how the uh, operations evolved, what their benefits were, a few pitfalls, and where we are now with it all. So um, basically, um, what happened was, as it gets to work, uh, I want it to. Um, uh, 
Right. Back in 2014, uh, myself and Steve been working together for a while and an inspector came to us. It's the inspector, you can see that picture there, standing at the front with his white hat on. Uh, inspector Jennings said, do you want to do some um, work around cyclists? And we were both mad keen cyclists um, to the point where we used to cycle into work together every day. Um, we said, yeah, want to do some work about cycling in work time? Fantastic, you know, no problem at all. We'll do that. And we started working with Birmingham City Council and Think Bike, um, all about um, the, the exchanging places with the, the blind spot mats. And that's what we started doing. Um, and that's how initially we got into it. And we had great fun, um, you know, um, in the summer of 2014 um, through to March 2015, basically going around um, all over the place uh, with the, the blind spot mat showing um, Cyclists, the blind spots on trucks, you've probably all seen it before, and vice versa, some truck drivers as well. Um, in hindsight, wasn't the right thing to do, but like I said, we had a great time. That's us with Ned at the cycle show. We took it to the cycle show. Um, but one thing I will say is when we did take the truck out, the chap you can see there with his back to us is a chap called Paul. And he um, he worked for Jaguar Land Rover. Um, and Jaguar Land Rover are absolutely brilliant. They give us the truck. It's one of their internal logistics trucks um, and a driver. And then they had to pay the overtime for him to do it on his day off as well. Uh, we never got paid overtime to do it. But he was a mad keen cyclist, Paul was. And he, what was great about Paul was is when we had truck drivers come up and start complaining about cyclists, he could give the, the other angle, if you like, and say, I drive the truck and I ride a, a push bike all the time. Um, this is how it plays out in reality so he, that was the one thing that came out of it that i thought you know maybe that's something we can take forward but like i said we took it everywhere that's us in um cannon hill park in king's heath exactly the same but what it gave us opportunity to do was engage with all the cyclists in the area and nationally when we went to the the cycle show and get their views on what was needed um what put them off cycling if you like commuting um, there's lots of recreational cyclists who were not utility cyclists, which is really what we wanted to do in partnership with the council. We want to increase cycling numbers, you know, we wanted children cycling to school, we wanted people cycling to work. So we started to try and change our mindset about what we were doing. Although we enjoyed greatly what we were doing, it wasn't, if you like, giving the people the confidence to go out there and change their way of travel, you know, that you create that modal shift that we all, we all strive for. And uh, like I said, but it was great fun um, to the point where there we are with the uh, team Sky Car, and that's one of Bradley's bikes, one of Bradley Wiggins' bikes we used to take around with us. Um, it was far too large for me to ride. Um, Steve, being six foot three, he could get on it though, and I just drove around the car pretending to be a director sportive. I think that was basically what I did in that. Um, so that was it. That that was what we were doing. Um, one last slide on that. What we were doing. That's um, us outside the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The reason we included that is because on that particular day we had a um, a news crew from the local um, ITV news turn up that day, and we dealt with the press plenty of times in the past. But that was my first negative experience with the press, really, and cycling, whereby the the team that turned up. They basically wanted, you know, some footage of, you know, a cyclist nearly being, you know, taken off a bike. And they were most disappointed when they found out they weren't going to get it. So that's when I started, you know, sort of changing my attitude towards the press and thinking, you know, I've got to be careful what I do with them and basically use them to my advantage. These are the sorts of things we'd been looking at previously, the behaviour of cyclists. There's some cyclists going across a, a green light, you straight in front of a car, if you like. And this is one from um, our patrol. You can't see it there, but that's an actual cyclist that is going the wrong way up a slip road onto the A45 in Birmingham. Um, you know, no problem at all for us on patrol. Saw them a mile off as you can if you're looking properly. It doesn't matter if people got lights on or what they're wearing, even in the darkness like that in the middle of November, early in the morning. If you're looking properly, you can always see them. But like I said, it wasn't achieving what we wanted to do overall. Um, and uh, we had a change of mindset, basically. I was getting more and more into evidential policing. And uh, there's two quotes I always use from um, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper when I'm presenting about what we did and what changed. The, the first one is um, the most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it that way. And the police are so guilty of doing that. They really are. I mean, as an organisation, we always fall back on what, what we think works instead of trying new things. And the second quote that uh, Grace Hopper is famous for is a ship in port is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. And that's so true in policing as well. 
Um, we, we can sit there and we can say, we've always done this, but you need to go out and change things. And that's what we decided to do. Um, and it was the perfect time to do it. And this is why a lot of people say, how come you were able to do it and other police forces weren't? And this is part of the reason really. Um, for a start, we had a very good team. Now that is our team from 2014. Now everybody in that picture there um, cycled to work. Um, and cycle back from work. No matter what the shift was, that's the whole traffic team there. Um, apart from Abby, who basically drove the team car when we went away on cycling trips. Um, she used to take everything, you know, that we needed for our camping trips when we cycled there. And if you were around Chelmsford Police Station in that summer, if you were about between midnight and three o'clock in the morning, depending on what time we all finished, you would see all of us cycling home in a pain gang, basically. Um, all together. So we had the right minded people. And when we started doing it, we had um, a great hierarchical setup as well. Our sergeants um, were very good. You know, the, the sergeants at the time had chuckled Andy Darks had cycled to work along the A34 Stratford Road for many years. If anybody knows Birmingham, it's that's a scary road to cycle on at the best of times. Then we had a sergeant at Laura Floyd, massively supported an inspector called Jason Waves, who was did Iron Men and, you know, all really took on board the, the vulnerable road users all the way up to, if you like, our PCC and our chief, you know, um, Dave Thompson, cyclist himself, and our PCC, David Jameson, ex-transport minister, really got why we were trying to do and how you know, valuable road safety work was. But in particular, addressing the greatest threat of harm, which is what we, we got stuck into, you know, um, straight away. We realised, you know, if you're going to change something, you're going to change an environment, you've got to address the greatest threat of harm. Um, and the way I always said it to people who, who didn't really get it, I said, if, if you came to the police and said, um, my son, my daughter, my wife won't go down the local shops because of the behaviour of a group of people on the street corner and, you know, it's either antisocial or that they're offending, intimidating them, the police would go out and do something about that. And it's exactly the same with people who want to cycle and say, oh, I won't cycle on the road because of the behaviour of motorists. It, it's exactly the same scenario you know you've got to change those people's behavior to stop um, them intimidating people if somebody else's behavior is stopping somebody making a positive lifestyle choice it's really something that has to be addressed and that's the way we viewed um, driver behavior and addressing the greatest threat of harm and that's really um, how we got the backing and like I said luckily our organization got it and we went forward with it um, and then we started thinking about what we were going to do and experimented with the law. And that suck it and see it comes from our legal department, believe it or not. Um, it came, what, many years ago, I ran an operation called, well, I started an operation called Hop Operation Hercules, um, which was all about illegal street racing. And I phoned them one day, our legal services department, and said, oh, I've got an idea around seizing cars on mod based on modifications and, and whether they've been street racing. Um, and I said, what do you think? And then literally the, the lawyer on the other side of the phone, he said, well, Mark, you know, the law is basically a case of you've got to suck it and see, so you've got to, you know, give it a go. And, you know, if it works in court, it works. If not, you can say you've tried it. And that's how we went forward um, with everything we did. And it was a bit of a, a thing, it became a, a thing for me to say, you know, um, never been tried before. We're going to try it, you know, nothing. You know, people will say, well, you can't do that. And you say, well, why not? Oh, it was a case of we've never done it before. And so look, we went out and tried it. And so um, me and Steve had discussions about what we were going to do going forward, uh, how we're going to address the greatest threat of harm. And that's how Operation Close Pass came about. Um, about the same time, in about uh, 2014, long before things like Operation Snap and the um, next base portal, um, we started um, experimenting with third party reported video. Um, the first one we ever did, and I, unfortunately I've been looking for the, the steals from the prosecution, I can't find them, it was from a cyclist that used to cycle along the Heartlands um, Parkway in Birmingham, quite a busy road. And the scenario was he was cycling to work one morning and a 44 tonner pulled straight out in front of him. And if he hadn't braked, he would have gone underneath it. But the, the footage was, was brilliant that it really was and he sent us the footage and I said I'm gonna this is the one I'm gonna start with you know I know we can do it we've been using footage as traffic officers from our cars for years um, we're gonna use this person's footage um, and we did and uh, I sent off the notice of intended prosecution to the transport manager of the company 
and uh, three days later i had a phone call um off the the transport manager saying i've got a driver who's very worried he's going to lose his license um because i sent off a load of still clips of exactly what had happened um he said uh, what's going to happen with him and i said well you know i said it fill out the notice of intended prosecution send it back and if his driver history is suitable i said you know he can have a course for due care and attention um and it, he was over the moon with that and so that reaction basically from the transport manager made me think yeah this we've got a way forward this with this and then that's how we started with the third party report and that grew and grew but i'll go into that in a bit at the same time we were discussing about how to because everybody we talked to when we've been going around talking to cyclists at the cycling show said drivers just pass us too close you know this is the one thing that really puts me off cycling on the road pass us too close so basically we had a discussion i said to steve i said Right, I've got a camera now because I bought a camera back then um, and it was a Garmin Verb Elite, um, more just to film my own cycling. That was it, you know, go, you know, replay stuff going downhill really fast and stuff like that. I said, I'm going to take it out. And I said, if, if I get any offences, I said, we'll start with those. And in um, basically October um, uh, 2015, I think, no, it was October 2014, sorry. Um, this was the very first um, close pass ever dealt with um, by the police based on video. Um, the very first close pass prosecution. And it was in a village called Ansley Common in Warwickshire. And uh, that's the first shot, as you can see, we come up to a pinch point and the driver thought he'd overtake me there. Um, and the great thing about the Garmin Verb is that uh, I could overlay all my, my data, which I was obsessed with at the time when I was younger and a bit fitter. Um, and you had things like your cadence sense and, and your speed and everything on there. Um, and basically that's how it ended up like that. And you can see my cadence dropped right off because actually I had to pull my, my knee in because I thought it was going to be hit at the time by the driver. And that was the first offence. Um, and the reason that became the first offence is because the driver stopped at the road, about 50 yards at the road, he stopped dead, didn't indicate. And basically I thought he was brake checking me, but he wasn't, he was on his phone, looking at his phone at the time. So I pulled alongside him, um, knocked on the window, um, out came the warrant card and I cautioned him, reported him on camera. And uh, when I was back at work later that week, um, out with the notice of intended prosecution again, um, which was replied to, and that is the very first close pass ever, um, you know, if you like, reported and prosecuted, although he, he obliged himself to a course um, in the UK and, and probably the world that was. Um, I, can't think, I don't know of anyone that's happened before that. And that was the start of it. That was the first one. Um, he took the course um, and then ironically, after the course, he made a complaint, um, an official complaint. Um, and came out with a story, um, said uh, he, we doxed the footage, which was quite funny, really, because um, we supplied him with a copy of the footage, um, as you know, uh, just to be fair. And he said there was a beeping noise, and he said he'd been told the beeping noise was um, where we doxed the footage. The beeping noise was my Garmin um, pausing at the time on the footage. And so, you know, that was the, the story of that one. Um, and in the end, th that went away um, when it proved we'd done everything right. And that was the start of it. Um, and then, you know, we started with a couple of others and here's another one that you've probably seen. That's a car that's actually exited from the junction on the near side, straight in front of me um, on another ride. Um, again, you know, there's sort of an in this and that's me waving my appreciation at them at the time. And so we started uh, we, we using our own footage um, and we had a few cracking ones. That's another one. That's uh, a truck that tried to put me underneath its wheels going to work. That's uh, in Kozel on the way to Charmswood Police Station. Um, and we started to use footage um, from a, a group of cyclists, local cyclists. Um, and we had cyclists from Coventry. Uh, we had George Reeves, who's a big uh, We Are Cycling UK regional coordinator. Um, sort of in the Samwell, West Brom area with the cyclists in Surrey, or we had a couple in Birmingham. And we knew from conversations we'd had with previous work, we could, we could trust them to send us footage and it would be okay to use. And our rule of thumb was that if, if it was 100% certain, you know, ones like you see there, we'd take your breath away when you watch the footage, we'd use it. And we started putting them through. And um, the only problem that I had um, with the third party footage as we went through, um and after about 18 months we got up to about 350 cases of third party footage for all sorts of offenses by then we're using them for phone offenses we're using them for parking offenses on zigzags 
close pass stuff, you know, um, good due care attentions. Um, it really was a case of I never had a not guilty plea, of course, which is what I really craved just to test the law, if you like, you know, to test it out, everything we're doing in court. And uh, as we went through, we did get a couple of, uh, eventually a couple of um, not guilty cases, which I'll come on to in a bit, but um, that was the one thing that we were craving at the time. But at the same time, we needed to do some turn operationally, and that's when Operation Close Pass came about. And that began with a conversation with um, Birmingham City Council. We worked with some great people from Birmingham City Council, and we sat down with a, a woman called Mandy Slater. We'd done lots of work with the truck. And when we said we're not going to do the truck, the blind spot, because it's not working for us, what we want to achieve anymore, she carried on that work, um, you know, taking it into schools, because we'd had a discussion and said, it's good for great for kids to teach them about the danger around trucks, but weren't working for us. You know, it wasn't what we were doing, working with what we wanted to do to address our greatest set of harm and things. So we sat down with Mandy Slade. She said, what do you want to do then? And we said, we want to do this operation. And Steve just basically said, we want to put Mark down the road and see if anybody kills him. And that's the way he put it. <laughs> and he said, if they don't kill him, we want to get them in and uh, basically uh, tell them why they shouldn't be uh, trying to kill Mark on the bike because he's a police officer. And then we can then, using that, if we can send Mark out um, uh, as a, you know, a very experienced cyclist, as a, um, a bike ability trainer, um, we can then say, look, we've got a cyclist here that's doing everything right. And when we send him out for a couple of hours, during that couple of hours, his life's been endangered several times by drivers. So if he's doing everything right with his road experience, what's the average cyclist use suffering on a daily basis? And then using that, we can, we can use that as an evidential basis to go forward and say to drivers, this is why we're doing it. You can say all you like about cyclists and what they do, but here's our police officer going out, doing everything right, lit up like a Christmas tree, whatever you want him to do, you know, um, and you're endangering him. As a group of people, you're endangering him. So, you know, this is why we were having to do it. And it was great and it worked. And then, so we launched in 2016. Um, by this time, uh, when we launched, we had a great team of partners involved. Um, we are Cycling UK with Duncan Dollymore. Um, we had Bob involved, you know, with the Road Danger Reduction Forum. Um, we had um, Chris Boardman come along to the launch. You know, really, really supportive group of people. And it worked, you know, the media um, coverage was absolutely fantastic. And this is the way they went. This is one of the photos you see all the time. And again, another thing, everybody thinks that's me on the bike. It's not. Um, I was front of house that day doing a lot of press stuff and a lot of interviews. And that's a chap called Chris Brock, who worked on our team at the time. And he was a um, sky cycling leader, really good, um, you know, ride leader, a really good cyclist and a hobby cyclist. Again, commuted every day by bike, no matter what the weather. Um, and that's him on the bike. So that's not actually me, you see. And the reason we got a Trek bike is because Chris Boardman came along and we couldn't use any Boardman bikes. And all my bikes are generally Boardman ones, fine, apart from a Dolan. Um, and so we used uh, Chris's Trek, um, Chris Bross's Trek as well. Um, and then, you know, the mat, we had the mat and we are cycling UK there and afterwards gave all the police forces a free mat. Um, and the mat is purely, it, you know you see that shot a lot and it wasn't meant to be a um a publicity shot it's an educational tool that mat is and we had to have a a they call it the chat on the mat but it's got to replicate um you know it's got to be a, a worthwhile experience for the driver because it, it takes the place of them being prosecuted or paying for a course and so it had to work and that, that design that final design we came up with is the one that worked best for us on the mat and Steve used to do a lot of the education at the start, um, talking to the cyclists, and then it moved over to, we used fire service to do the, um, the actual education on the mat. The reason being is we found uh, running through that people are more receptive to people that they think they're gonna help them. And the, the police uniform comes with a lot of baggage um, for a lot of people for very different reasons. Um, some people have good experiences with the police, some people have bad experiences. And if, it's, if they're talking to a police officer, they basically think they're being told off. Um, and so we started using the fire service and we used um, Woodgate Valley predominantly, their crew, they had a lot of cyclists and they were really, really good. And the feedback from the people we had on the mat is that they were a lot better than us, um, just because they perceived fire, the fire service to be, you know, people who go out there and help people. And the message came across clearer. clearer. The only people we found who were better than the fire service regards drivers being receptive is that uh, if we use paramedics, 
um, but paramedics are always busy um, and we couldn't get paramedics that often to do it. So we stuck with the fire service and that worked really well. And so Operation Close Pass was up and running and most of you know about Close Pass and the rest is history really. Um, and while that was going on, the third party reporting grew and grew um, and we had some court cases. Um, our first court case uh, for a trial was with um, George Reeves, who I mentioned earlier, who is um, a regional coordinator from Wales Cycling UK, had one with a, um, a heavy goods vehicle. Um, it was a rigid heavy, heavy goods vehicle. Um, I remember the trial well, and basically um, the trial went ahead and George was uh, cross-examined as was the driver um, and the driver says you know I'm a class one driver I've got this experience and never did anything wrong the great thing about George Rees was he's a class one driver too and I put in an expert witness statement um, regards the standard of George's um, cycling um, from my you know police experience and my you know um, cycling coaching qualification um, and basically the, the summing up in the magistrate said, but, but you know, exactly what we always wanted, um, you, you know, as a professional driver, you should know, Bessie, you're far too close, there's your five points, there's your £600 fine. And so we walked out of court and said that, yeah, that, that's the first time it's been tested, we were very happy with that. And, but by this point, we were getting on for like 500 cases we dealt with third party. Um, and it, the workload has been too much, uh, becoming too much. And what we were starting to find is, because we were starting to take footage from a couple of drivers as well, from dash cam footage, is that we were getting, you know, sort of um, a lot of very useful footage, but we literally time constraints meant me and Steve couldn't action them all. And we were getting stuff like this. And, you know, sort of what you see there is a, a, one driver endangering everybody in the road at the same time. You know, the close past the cyclist nearly hit the car head on. There's somebody who really needs to be dealt with. And what we found was we were getting all these bits of footage and they were just absolutely, you know, sort of uh, what we wanted as traffic officers, because we can't be everywhere at the, the same time. But it gave us opportunities to deal with literally the most dangerous drivers on the road because although we can't be everywhere at the same time there's always could be somebody with a, a camera and that was the thinking behind operation close pass it's a psychological thing where and i'll talk about this later because i said i've mentioned about the exit of um news that bob talked about earlier where they're giving people cameras and why it's such a good thing but basically and i always just use this expression when i presented to other police forces um, and I said, I'd never use it in public. And I don't really think this is public, please by invite only, but you weaponize every cyclist on the road against road harm. Every driver suddenly thinks that that cyclist is carrying a camera and they start behaving around them because of that. They may not like it, you know, sort of they may not like vulnerable road users, but what they don't like is being prosecuted. And that's what that the whole, you know, scenario creates. They don't know if it's the undercover police officer on a bike. I don't know whether it's a cyclist with a camera who's going to submit the footage. Um, and so it just changes their behavior. And that's what we wanted as, you know, from our point of view, as a police force, we wanted that change in behavior because as I've talked about it last week, it cuts the demand for us. We get less collisions, you know, less reports of dangerous driving, fantastic. And from a, then from a, a, you know, sort of our partner's point of view, um, you create an environment where people are suddenly happy to go out on the road on a push bike with, that's because they think the drivers could behave, you know, differently. And they genuinely did. We saw that, we saw drivers uh, changing differently. Or they suddenly they thought that they had a bit of empowerment, that if they were become a victim, they, would, they had some kind of, you know, sort of recompense, they could report the driver and do something themselves. Big part of it was the media and getting it right. Um, last week, you, you probably picked up on that. I said, there's no such thing as, you know, sort of um, a bad media when it comes to things like it's just awareness. Um, we worked with a, a chap at uh, Westmead called Brig Ford and Brig was very unusual when it comes to sort of a, a police communication department in that police corporate comms departments are very used to firefighting. They don't do a lot of what I call aggressive comms, if, if you like, putting stuff out there. Um, they're more used to dealing with criticism, whereas what we had with Brig was a partner who put our message across in the right way. So when we were challenged, um we were able to respond in, in the right manner and he put together some great stuff with us and gave us some real good opportunities um you know within you know two months of launching up creation close pass we were on the one show so there we were at prime time seven o'clock going out to seven and a half million people 
Um, and suddenly, we, we, you know, then seven and a half million people watch the one show. Tell another seven and a half million people if they just told one, one more person in their family or somebody at work. And we were spreading the word. And again, when it comes to behaviour change, it was very important. Um, two appropriate media opportunities can replace 100 operations by police officers in, in just behaviour change alone. And that's what we were trying to achieve. And the one thing I was delighted about, if you were mentioned on GCN at the time, like I said, is sort of um, that was my the thing that did it for me. And then we moved on. We went to the cycle show again, but instead of being outside, we're inside being interviewed on the stage. That's us with Duncan from We Are Cycling UK, um, and you know that's us with Chris, um, and it just went on and on. And because of the publicity, it became really good. Because then when we had more third party stuff going to court when the trial was brought the magistrates to sit there on the bench at the front and instead of having to be explained what operation close pass was as soon as they mentioned operation close pass all the magistrates knew what close pass was what was involved and what we were trying to achieve and what the actual offense we were looking at that you know due care offense and that's why the media was critical and worked so so well um Right, the next stage, when it's all in place. So it was launched, it was working. Um, we couldn't deal with the third party stuff anymore because it was too much. So we handed it over to the Traffic Investigation Unit, Westminster Police. Um, the manager there, Stu Baker, we did a presentation for him and his staff, told them what we were doing, showed them the premises we worked to, um, and explained to them the main thing is demand. And we, again, we said, we, we're not bothered about numbers. As much as we'd like to put through as many as possible, we want just a steady stream of stuff that's going to go through um, we're not going to lose at court because there's certainties that we can put out there and just change wholesale driver behaviour as a result once they're where it's going on. And they take it, they took it on. And now, you know, in the West Midlands, we do 3,000 offences a year um, through them from all sorts of, um, you know, sort of um, camera opportunities, whether it's motorcyclists, cyclists, um, people on foot, actually. Um, we get a lot of people filming stuff with mobile phones on foot as well now, especially around zebra crossings and things like that, you know, sort of pedestrian crossings. Um, and, and from on buses, after the bus thing, but that save that for another day. Um, so once it's all in stage and when it's there and working and working well, and you've got to have the three different elements for operation close to pass, to operation close pass to work and change behaviour. You've got to have the police officers out doing it. You've got to have the media approach right, and you've got to have the third party reporting. If you take away one element, it doesn't work. Once it's out there working, it basically then gave us opportunities to do other things because we didn't have to do the operations all the time. We literally knocked it down. We're doing probably one, two operation close passes ourselves a month. Um, the one problem we had with close passes once it was up and established is we weren't getting the close passes um, on the operations anymore. Not enough to justify, you know, just running an operation close pass. And that's when we developed operation close pass plus where um, as well as the bike cams, I started taking out helmet cam and we started doing seat belts at the same time and phone up offences and all sorts just to give us that bit of added extra value but what then we could do it gave me time to go out on the bike on the infrastructure and so we're looking you know when the Birmingham infrastructure was launched um, I would go out um, on uniform um, uh, in uniform sorry and sometimes not in uniform on the Birmingham infrastructure and what I'd call police the infrastructure um and literally i could use the infrastructure to ride up and down with the helmet cam on next to the road get drivers on phones but more importantly i could start dealing with people who made the infrastructure um unsafe for other people so like parking on the routes um you know sort of when i'm about and about parking on zigzags there's lots of different things i could do and of course people who didn't really get the infrastructure so there's a taxi driver trying his best to knock me into the um bristol road um, and there's another one on the A34, again, the same sort of thing with another driver. And so I could go up and down. And for those, all those offences that you've seen there, I was in full uniform. Um, so it's not like they couldn't see me. And, you know, it gave us opportunity to you know, build again an evidential base and send people to court for all the different things. And while we went about, we could also deal with people, not, you know, um, other offences with other cycling infrastructure. And there's one on Seven Road um, as well. So, I mean, that was close pass and third party reporting and how it came about and now you know like i said it's spread everywhere um 
Operation Close Pass happens in various forms all over the world. We had inquiries from countries, you know, Australia, Canada, all of Europe. Some people did it one stage further. The Spanish blessed them out of a helicopter on their mountain passes where they got lots of cyclists in monitoring the gaps and stuff. I don't think we could go to that sort of expense. But um, it worked and it worked well. And now, you sort of, you know, you, you, everybody really knows about Close Pass and third party reporting has moved on to the next stage for Operation Snap. Um, and it's where we exactly envisaged it being, you know, all over the country uh, with people submitting footage, with police forces doing, you know, the odd operation to reinforce it and the media getting right. Which brings me on to what we've heard this week about the Exeter bike camera giveaway and why it's a good idea. And this goes back down to, again, if, you, if you've got a small budget and you want to change driver behaviour, the best way of doing it. So Exeter bike camera and and. Bob said earlier there may not be the, the best cameras and there may not be you know massive amounts of numbers but that doesn't matter because if you put that in the local paper the, the, the cyclists are being given cameras to report um, dangerous driving like I said earlier it, it, it basically you've got every cyclist then being deterrent against what is the greatest threat of harm which is offending driving um, the people driving around Exeter won't know whether that cyclist has got a camera or not but it, it will change their behaviour around that cyclist once they they realise that the cameras are being given away, um, and you know they're being used. The, the only thing I would say is that they need to follow it up with a couple of prosecutions from the cameras, and they only have to publicise a couple of them um, to reinforce the fact that they're being used. And all of a sudden, you've got a great deterrent. And what I've always said is, I can influence the behaviour of 95% of drivers. The other 5%, you, you can't. And in those 5% are people like me who think they're the best driver in the world because of the training they've had and won't listen to anybody else. You, you've got the, the mentally ill who don't listen to anybody. And then you've got the genuine criminal element that won't change their behaviour no matter what. But the other 95% out there, once they get that idea in the head that there's a good chance they're going to be caught um, if they do have an interaction around a cyclist that is in any way going to harm them um, because they've potentially got a camera or potentially it's a police officer on a bike, um, it changes what they do massively. And that is why that extra bike camera giveaway with a small budget, I mean, let's face it, with £2,000, something like that now, you could buy at least 20 um, cheaper cameras if you like um that's all you need to do and you'll get a very good result for that money um and so you know whoever's put up that money whether it's you know the actual council i don't know but um and knowing exeter like i do i used to spend a lot of time down there on holiday and done some cycling down there um the way that people drive down there especially when you've got the rural roads and bits and pieces like that it will work well and change behavior and like i always say they may not like it but um you know they they, they they have to put up with it and they can say what they like, but it's out there and it will change the behaviour. Um, and so that is a potted history of um, Operation Close Pass, how it came about, and third party reporting and how that came about. And like I said, if you asked me six years ago um, what we would want to achieve um, when we started it all, I, I couldn't be more happy, really. And Steve's exactly the same. Um, the way it's grown nationally and internationally, Six years ago, we were struggling as vulnerable road users to get any sort of road justice. Everybody knows that. And now we're at a point where, you know, at least if you've got the footage or somebody else has got the footage and something happens um, and, you know, you have that close pass or you have that person pull out and you're at a junction, um, something can be done about it. And, you know, the effect on drivers is, you know, as you see, I mean, I love it now when I, I ride around or drive around, I see a cyclist on the road. I don't watch the cyclist, I watch the driver, I watch the car and see what they're going to do now. And that's what I'm fascinated with the driver behaviour. And, you know, when I see that, that car, I'll pull, you know, wait for the gap, pull to the other side of the road and give the cyclist the whole road, you know, whole road. I, I always think, well, you would never have seen that six years ago. And so it's getting out there. And the more that we do it, the better it will become. And that's it, really. Thank you for your time. Yeah, that was absolutely brilliant, Mark. Uh, I'll, I'll just want to thank you for all the work you're doing, really. I'm sure everybody else would. We've completely run out of time for questions, but I'm sure Mark, mind you, approaching him on Twitter and stuff is uh, just like that. Right now, so. That's it. If anybody's got any questions, just, just stick them on my Twitter account and I'll answer them on Twitter. That's it. Yeah, so fantastic. Magic. So, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. I'll just ask uh, Ruth to say a literal last word and then... Uh, We'll, we'll see you all next week for 
the part two of the history of highways together. And I'm hoping Mark could come back again because I uh, definitely could listen to you all night. And I get a feeling you could talk on that as well. And I'm, well, we'll, we'll give you a full session. Yeah, that was, that yeah. was absolutely fantastic work. I, I can keep, I can, there's lots of operations can do on, but I can also, I can give you one that uh, it'd be interesting for people to hear that sort of, you know, one that is a brilliant operation, but we didn't get the media right on it. So it didn't work in the way that we wanted to. So, you know, it's, it's a learning curve and, you know, anybody who says they don't make mistakes in my job, he's lying basically. So, you know, I think yeah, well, people, for people to be, we were gone wrong as well as right. Well, keep up the good work and keep trying things out for sure. Keeping us all safe there. I wanted to call you a hero, but I was thinking, well, he's doing what we all do and we all go through that but it's fantastic that you are bringing that to everybody's attention so uh yeah i'll just quickly say something about the risk assessment on operation close pass and saying what we all do is that the, the police are very risk averse and when steve was writing the risk assessment for operation close pass i said that he was a bit worried that they weren't going to let us do it and i said that they can't say that i said because they can never let us know because all we do is put a cyclist down the road doing whatever you know, thousands of well, tens of thousand people do every day, and that's cycle on the road. And I say, you know, if, if they did turn around and say that's too dangerous to do, I said, what more do you need to, to you know, to, to say something needs to be done? And so, you know, luckily, the only the only thing we ever had was that um, they wouldn't let us do any very heavy rain. Nothing to do with the cycling. It's just that the, in case the mat got slippy and somebody slipped over on it. <laughs> <laughs> Health and safety. There you go. Today, due to popular demand, we're going to do third party reporting, um, a discussion around third party reporting, with a focus on um, the feedback process, which is so problematic, but um, is a vital part of the actual process if it's going to work especially going forward um i did plan this originally with slides but when i practiced it it took far too long so those who wish to see this with slides will have to wait till the conference season starts proper once we're out of lockdown and uh, i might do it then um but it's going to be solely for my notes um and so here we go right we're going to start with third party reporting and an overview why it's important and why it works well, many years ago in 2014, 2015, when we first started um, experimenting with third party reporting and people's footage to prosecute defences, uh, we knew straight away it worked um, just because the evidence was so good and it was so easy. Um, there were a few naysayers that said it couldn't be done, but the, the process is exactly the same as using police evidence, so we knew it would work. It gave us a, a huge number of benefits that we couldn't get from obviously detective offences. Um, for a start, high quality evidence, the cameras, even back in 2014, 2015, were much better quality images produced than we had, say, in the cameras in our police cars, and still are to this day. We don't have HD cameras in, in any of our police cars, which is quite problematic at work. But the stuff that we're using out on the streets now, um, in our own cars, on helmet cams, wherever it may be, even on your phone, produces a much better standard of, um, of footage. And things like the, the, the vehicle registration marks are really easily seen on footage. So when it comes to identifying potential offenders, no problems at all. The other things we found, extra opportunities to target the most dangerous people on the road. We, as police, we knew we couldn't be everywhere. And there's nothing more frustrating than talking to a victim of a road traffic, you know, danger, what I would call crime. Crime is what it is. Don't let's dress it any other way. Um, it is crime. It, you know, it, it, people call it all sorts of things, but they are criminal offences. Um, we can't be there all the time. There's nothing more frustrating as an officer having somebody relay an incident to you and saying, and you haven't to turn around and say, well, it, it's your word against theirs. Cameras changed all that. And when people start giving us the footage, it gave us those opportunities to target those people who really did endanger other people. Most importantly, it gives a 24 seven credible chance of an offender being detected, evidenced and prosecuted. And we call it the average speed camera effect. Average speed cameras work wonderfully well because drivers know that they're effective. And if they speed through an area, they're gonna be caught. Um, third party reporting using video evidence, it gives exactly the same for every other road traffic offense. And, and that should not be dismissed you know, lightly, it really is a game changer, probably the game changer in my career when it comes to traffic policing. Um, you can cover um, most offences, which is a real big winner for behaviour change, wholesale behaviour change as well. There are some things that you can't cover using third party reporting, things such as speeding. Um, you can cover some extreme speeding offences. Problem with speeding is, is that you do it for, 
to ascertain a speed from a video clip, you have to use frame rates and it has to be done by a professional on the collision investigation unit and it's timely and cost, not really cost effective when it comes to the other you know, ways that we do detect offences, but everything else can be detected. Some things can't like seat belts because questions have to be asked, you know, say a seat belt offence, you know, is the seat belt working? Does the person have an exemption certificate? But everything else generally can I give you some examples, you know, um, children sitting on laps of people in, in the front seats of cars, you know, the danger due to the way that passengers carry that offences. Um, all the things that you don't normally associate with, you know, third party reporting, insecure loads, you know, just a good bit of footage, everything that can endanger the road users. Generally, you, you can report it in a third party manner. Um, and so it's got a very wide reaching, you know, um, effect on all sorts of offending. And it's easy to do from a policing point of view. It's cost neutral or even cost positive. Now, this is the one thing that people don't seem to realise. We had it costed out when we first started doing this by um, a, a chief inspector, Kerry Blakeman, who's now retired, bless him. And he got very interested in what me and Stephen doing. He did a business case analysis on it. And he came to the conclusion that um, without any other extra income, and I'll come on to the extra incomes at the moment, it was costing 9p per submission um, for the police. And that 9 pence, that was, you know, we just stood there. He said, you know, you sure got that right? He says, yeah, we've done the figures. It's 9 pence. That's what it's costing us. So it's incredibly cheap, but it becomes cost positive because what, what happens is, is when we get extra avenues of detecting offences and those offences aren't contested because the evidence is good, then generally they, their disposal is of, you know, in a number of manners, one of which is a course, if the person's eligible, which the police get a kick back off. OK, and the other one is, is ultimately if it's a severe offence or the person's not eligible for conditional offer or for a course or, or you know, um, which is contested matter, of course, it goes to a police led prosecution, single justice court. Um, a guilty plea there um, results in a, um, costs of usually about 100 to 110 pounds for the police led prosecution team. They can do 30 in a day which more than covers the cost of the police prosecuting those offences. So it becomes a cost benefit to the police. Um, so from a cost and demand point of view up to this stage, you know, from a police force point of view, it, again, there's, there's no barriers to it whatsoever. Then we had the development of the next place portal, which really opened it up and gave no excuses to any police force ever. You know, next place, they produce the cameras, they produce this lovely little portal. So you submit your footage here, complete this little, um, statement that we've provided for you we'll pass it on to the police force uh, the relevant police force and they can action it and so the police force then didn't even have to build a digital reporting um you know portal or format because we had a ready-made one all you got to do was you know have somebody at the other end triaging all the offenses and the triaging is very quick from a police point of view because literally a person would come in on the morning that open up the you know, the inbox look at the the footage the footage two to three minutes per clip and it literally is from a trained professional point of view that's pros that's pros prosecutable that's not so literally when you triage offenses you can do up to you know 20 30 in an hour sometimes so it is quite a quick process in course with third party pros um, reported offenses what you find is is that the evidence is that of a victim or a concern member of the public, and it, the evidence given by somebody, if it does end up at court from a third party reported offence, is taken in a very different light to a uniformed officer reporting a traffic offence, because the courts see that person, you know, not as the police officer, it's somebody from society whose behaviour changed because of this offence committed by a, usually a driver. And so the resulting weight that is given in court and the weight then in sentencing is a lot more. And what you tend to find is the sentencing from third party reporting offences is slightly higher than that from, you know, those reported by a uniformed officer. I've sat in on many trials from, you know, third party reporting offences. Um, and you see a significant difference in the way that the evidence is dealt with by the court because it's not somebody from the police who, you know, like it or not, they, they see us as having, you know, um, amounts of offences that we've got to get processed or anything like that. It's not the case at all. We, we don't have targets at all in the police. It's a bit of an urban myth. But again, because it's a normal moment of the public, 
it just it just handled in a very different way and in, in, in the way that it should be if you like third party reporting also gives a different access channel to the police and what we, we tell, started to find is is that people wouldn't who wouldn't normally report things to the police would suddenly start reporting things to the police through third party reporting and you started getting offenses that you wouldn't pick up anywhere else so people who report things as road traffic offenses and i'll come on to this later when it comes to the feedback but then they report a road traffic offence that then turned out to be not a road traffic offence at all, but it was a public order offence, or in some cases, a racially aggravated public order offence. These are the sort of offences that as police forces we really need to pick up, you know, because they're not traffic offences, they're offences against the person and, and could be a lot more serious. And all of a sudden you have another avenue for people reporting those. And if the, the option was phoning the police and having to speak face to face with the police officer, they wouldn't have done that. So the, you know, the digital reporting of a third party offence just gave us access to those sorts of offences that we never had before. So as you can see, third party reporting overall is a bit of a no brainer for everybody involved, for the road users, for the police, you know, there's just everything's a win win until we come to feedback. And this has been the real crux of the matter throughout. Now, it is the one problematic area we have regarding third party reporting. But first of all, we have to look at why feedback is important. Um, and I, I'll give you an example of why that we look at feedback in the police regards road traffic offences, regards officers. Now, in, in my most prolific years when I was on the road harm team, I'd be prosecuting in the region about 3,000 offenders a year. Um, I would get feedback on about 50 cases at those 3,000, and those are the cases I went to court with, unless I was, you know, a specific interest in a case, because I thought that was a really bad one, I'm going to find out what happened to it, and that would take me a long time to find out, and that is the way that, that the police force views feedback, you know, in regards to road traffic offences, that was their normal course of business. But why it's important, again, you have members of the public reporting, is because it improves the process. Um, part of the brilliance of third party reporting is the victim empowerment you have these people who have basically been victims of, of driving behavior or you know other road going behaviors all these years um, and have nothing you know no recompense against it you know basically and no way of, of having any sort of justice regards what happens to them on a daily basis and when i say justice it sounds a bit you know it can sound you know a bit exaggerated and a bit excitable but let's face it all those that use active travel will know that if you go out on a journey you will genuinely be sometimes endangered seven times on a journey that doesn't happen to car drivers at all you know and, and so that that balance being brought back into the system is very important and so the feedback was very much you know letting people know now Police have long recognised the importance of witness and victim feedback updates in other areas. So if I was to arrest somebody for an assault, I, when I'm processing that prisoner um, in the block, I would have a checklist to go down and say, have you informed the witnesses? Have you informed the victim of all the, the, the progress and everything like that? And very much so the, the police know how important feedback is in other areas. We've just got to apply it to the third party process, um, if you like, to get the same benefits from it. Um, the only issue is, is that feedback causes demand. Now, in the third party reporting process that we've talked so far, there's been very little demand created. And this is the reason why it causes demand. Um, but before I move on to demand, I'd just like to put it in the backdrop of police forces at the moment don't like demand. Um, we're hard pressed as it is, you know, we suffered lots of cuts. And we're going to have a very busy summer. We've got mutual aid requests down to port because, you know, problems with Brexit. We've got mutual aid requests to because of protests. Um, we've got the COVID crisis, you know, to deal with as well, um, not only in the means of enforcement, but also shortages of staff because of isolation and things like that. Um, so, you know, anything that does create demand without a very noticeable um, benefit, police tend to shy away from. There is a very noticeable debt benefit, and I'll come on to that towards the end. But why feedback is problematic, it's individual. Um, back in 2017, when we handed over 
um, the third party reporting process in the West Midlands to the Traffic Investigation Unit. We never really thought about feedback as it got upscaled because when me and Steve did it, you know, we were doing 350 cases a year and it was very good. We'd come in, we'd have cases sent to us from, you know, our usual um, reporters, some very good, the ones we could trust. Um, and on the whole, we could phone somebody, say, I'll give an example, I'm sure George won't mind me uh, mentioning, but George Reeves, um, who works for Cycling UK as a regional representative, we could phone him and say, George, yeah, your clip's excellent, it's up to the standard as usual, clear offence, uh, the nip's going out, um, check the driver out, he's got no points on his licence, he's never had a course before, he'll probably end up with the course. It was a five minute conversation. Then we had other conversations with people that we, you know, we had to phone up and say, you know, you cannot stand in front of the bus and threaten the life of the bus driver in front of all the people on the bus because you're committing a public order offence. And that turned into an hour long conversation. But it wasn't a problem for me and Steve because literally we were coming into work sometimes an hour and a half early to get all this work done before we started our normal work, driving, you know, the traffic car around the West Midlands doing the usual work. So we never really thought about the feedback process. Um, but it was important because we, we could tweak behaviour changes. If we had a clip, well, you know, sometimes we'd get clips off some cyclists and, and we'd look at them and go, you can't carry on cycling like that. You know, you, you, you're cycling far too close to the curb. You've got her in a primary position there. So there were benefits to all aspects. So, you know, we're improving people's cycling at the same time. We're improving people's driving. You know, um, you know we, there was lots of other aspects that we were improving all the time. But to do it properly, it takes time. And time, like I said, unfortunately, when it comes to policing, is demand. Um, each bit of feedback that you give from a third party reporting board is individual. And the only way you can do it is one-to-one -one communication. I've tried to think through lots of you know digital ways and IT ways of doing it, but you can't because each clip's individual and you've got to interact with that person and say, right, your clip's good because of this. Your clip's bad because of this. There's no specific what you know parameters you could put into an algorithm or a program to, to, to do it digitally. You've got to have a human interaction when you do it. Types of feedback, the positive ones, it's great to have a clip that comes through. And 95% of the clips that you do get sent through, even now, are of fantastic quality. And people generally know what is an offence, what is an offence, and what we expect. So the positive feedback is really easy. You can phone the person or send them an email, send them a letter, say, thank you very much for your clip. You know, it meets the evidential criteria, yet the offence is met, and this is the way it's going to be disposed of. Now, some forces use letters, warning letters as disposals. I'm not a great fan. We don't do it in the West Midlands. Personally, I think when it comes to the driver behavioural change, warning letters are a waste of time. Um, if you tell somebody not to do it again, they the old wives are going to be caught. They generally don't believe you. Um, but in the West Midlands, we offer, you know, three other disposals. You've got your course, you've got your condition offer or court. So you're phoning the person saying, right, this person's probably going to get a course, going to be offered one in the first instance. If you don't take it up, they'll, offer, they'll be given a condition offer of, you know, three pounds, or you know, three points and a hundred pound fine or whatever the condition offer is for that offence. Or they'll end up at course, you know, a court disposal. Um, and very few people actually attend court from third party reporting matters, um, you know, you have to be a very prolific offender, um, very prolific um, reporter, sorry, to attend a court, you know, at least a couple of times in a year. So the positive feedback is very easy to do. Um, where the time's taken is with the, the, the not positive um, feedback. And there's lots of things and lots of reasons why some clips won't make the evidential standard. Um, for a start, lots of people um, tend to report things that aren't actually offences. Um, it happens a lot more with drivers than people using active forms of travel. Um, for example, you'll get drivers reporting offences and, you know, um, you'll get some, I mean, as we're in this forum, uh, here's a cyclist riding on the pavement and then you'll view the clip and go, yeah, that's a shared path. Um, here's a cyclist not using the cycle lane. Oh, yeah, they don't have to use the cycle lane. And so, you know, but you've got to phone these people and tell them, put them right, because like I said, there's different types of feedback and it is beneficial. You have a conversation with this driver and say, you need to go back and revisit the highway code because, you know, and then, and then submit some more footage for us when you know what you're talking about. Um, so there's lots of things like that, that we have to deal with. 
And then there's things that other things that aren't traffic offence. Like I said, you'll get some clips submitted and people will say, oh, I had this traffic offence. And you'll look at the footage and go, well, actually, no, that's a road traffic collision because they've hit you. You need to submit this form. Actually, that's an assault because the person's laid hands on you. Uh, never mind the traffic offence. They, they, sh they shouldn't be doing that. Or it's a public order offence because, you know, that you know we see lots with drivers, don't we? People getting out of cars, waving things about, saying, you know, all sorts of things. And so they're then passed on to another department to deal with, you know, to just you know crime reports that has to be done it has to be investigated this person has to be brought in an interview and so we move on from what is a you know a general um traffic offense to a, a much more serious offense against the person not a negative thing in any way because we're picking up offenses that should be picked up but you know as a police force they're coming through a different avenue and there are offenses that wouldn't have been reported to us before so it's something we should be grateful of but again it creates demand and, and police forces are you know don't like demand like i said um the rejection of evidence um again not the standard you gotta have conversations with people and when it comes back to feedback and the classic ones are people who report the drivers especially report um red light offenses this person's done a red light so you'll view the clip and say Fantastic. I can see the lights red. But I can't see the stop line on the clip. So unless I can see the stop line and the red light, I can't say to a court, here's the person going across the stop line when the light's red, because they might have been already across the stop line before the light's red. Um, and there's lots of little specifics like that you have to outline to people to improve the evidence that they then submit next time. Because what you don't want to do is lose these people from the process, because the more people you have submitting evidence, the more chances you've got to prosecute those people who are truly dangerous to other people in society when they drive motor vehicles. And you don't want to put them off. So, again, it's why feedback is important. You can only be done one to one. But it has to be a telephone conversation with this person to improve their evidence. Um, We'll only take 100 percenters. So literally, like, it's like I always say with the close pass stuff, when we said, unless you watch a clip and there's a shark intake of breath, or you go, oh yeah, that was really close. They're the ones you wanna put before a court because you've gotta look at the overall picture of why we do it as a police force. From the personal point of view, the people submitting, like I said, it's victim empowerment, it's a chance to, to do your bit for society. From a police force point of view, it's about wholesale driver change behavioural change to drive down the amount of KSI as you get on, on the roads and reduce demand. There's me talking about demand again, but that's what it's all about, to free yourselves up to do other sorts of policing. Um, what you don't want to do is, is weaken the work stream. So you don't put things into court that you're going to lose because as soon as that happens, drivers won't have the same psychological effect of thinking, well, if I do get caught, actually, people are getting away with it when they're reported by other people. So we don't want that. So literally, again, we only take the 100 percenters. So if there's any sort of weakness in the evidence, um, again, it's a lengthy phone call to the person reporting saying, this is why we couldn't use your evidence. Sorry, but next time, can you do this, this or this? And maybe not say this, you know, <laughs> anything like that. Um, submit a behaviour, which takes me on nicely. I said, don't do this. Like I mentioned earlier, I've had clips before when I've had people threatening a bus driver in front of a, a bus load of people. You, you can't do that when it comes to a bit of bad language courts and the police will go yes a natural reaction if you saw me in a traffic car at work some of the language that comes out of my mouth when i see people do stuff or when you're in the middle of a pursuit you know i stand there in front of a court and say your, your worships i'm really sorry you're going to hear some abhorrent language from myself but it was you know heat to the moment you know and i was generally you know afraid for my safety or other people's safety and you know i've had magistrates turn around as a result and say don't worry it's perfectly accepted we don't blame you you know under the circumstances warranted and it's the same with people you know submitting stuff if you have somebody who genuinely endangers your life you, you are going to come up with the, the odd cuss word there's no two ways about it what you cannot be doing is chasing that person down yeah. and, and threatening them in any way you know be the better person let them go unfortunately we have some clips where we uh, you know you have that you know the driver is going to be done for a road traffic offence, but due to the person reporting's reaction, they're going to end up being done for a public order offence or an offence against the person sometimes. So again, you have to phone, explain, you know, if you want to follow this through, there's a good chance you're going to end up, he's going to end up with a driving conviction, you're going to end up with a criminal conviction. Next time, let's do things differently. So again, feedback is all very individual and very tricky, you know, and, and it becomes a lengthy process. It can escalate into conversations of more than 30 minutes. I know because I've been there and done it. So there's the problem we suddenly have, uh, a demand issue. Um, every other part of the third party process is 
really effective for everybody involved until we get to the feedback. Now, can it work? Well, the good news is yes, it can work and feedback can be done, but this is the way to do it. Third party reporting can be done at a local level where officers and PCSOs have time to do the feedback. Um, it's perfectly evidenced by Operation Park Safe running the West Midlands. Operation Park Safe, for those who don't know, it's an effective way of reporting all parking offences that endanger um, those that need the pavements or, you know, um, active travel users or, you know, other drivers, by the way, manner in which vehicles are parked. Um, I went round and I upskilled every single neighbourhood officer in the West Midlands uh, during 2018, 2019 part of which was the third party reporting process. The difference being that all parking offences, uh, and it includes zigzag lines, vehicle left in dangerous position, obstructions, you know, um, at the whole caboodle of parking offences is they went to the local neighbourhood team in their local um, email box. So the person would fill out a online reporting form, uh, a pro forma statement, submit their photographs, and. Um, um, bang it through to the local neighbourhood team. They would then triage it and they're fantastic. We can use this. We'll send out, a, you know, we'll, we'll do the ticket and the NRP will go out. Um, or basically um, they'd say, not this time, this reason, or they'd tell them what the other disposal was because the great thing about neighbourhood police is they could go around, knock on a door, say to the owner of the car, do you realise you're blocking the pavement for Mrs Miggins who lives down the road and needs to use To the mobility scooter and they would go sorry i won't do it again so at that sort of level the local neighborhood policing level there's plenty of time and the feedback can be given in the ways that i've described and you can improve the process and it's almost like the golden chase of policing when it comes to repeat calls at uh, local neighborhood policing because you've got that repeat caller you can say right well, you give us the evidence you fill out the form we'll make your problem go away or the person thinks well they give me the ideal solution i'm just not going to phone again and so it reduces demand for the police so it's a real win-win situation the problem solved or the demand goes away from the police and generally the problem solved because these people are phoning already. When it comes to the large scale upscaling that we're looking at, you know, the thousands of offences being submitted by, you know, dash cam, head cam, cycle cam, people on buses, filming people on phones, we need a national approach, okay, uh, and this is where it's going to become a little bit trickier and it's up to people like me to do the work um, to do this to make this happen and i'm already looking at doing it there needs to be a business case analysis to show that the full benefits of third party reporting over officer detected offenses and third party reporting offenses are cheaper than officer detected offenses away from you know the, the real volume stuff like speed because you can't get somebody in a, in a, um, a van um you know you can't get cheaper than that detecting speed and offenses or a static camera but when it comes to things like due care phone offences, um, red light offences, all the things that are normally offered to detect it, you're not going to get a better way of detecting them than third party reporting because it's everywhere all the time, like the reasons I've already said. So it's up to people like me to go around, prove for a, a business case and I say, this is the cheapest way of doing this. If we do this, we're going to save money over and above officers detecting them. That will then lead to initial investment and the initial investment is just on the feedback. Like I said, we already have everything in place for the actual reporting. The feedback's the last piece of the jigsaw, if you like, that just needs to slide into place just to satisfy those people that are reporting. To have that 100% feedback with everybody. So then the small investment, a small number of staff who make the phone calls, who've got the knowledge to say, and they can be retired police officers, they can be volunteers, you know, it can be anybody. But to phone these people and say, you know all the things that i've just covered that would then complete the jigsaw of third party reporting but it's that case has got to be made and it's a short-term investment because let's face it whether we you know whether you believe in autonomous vehicles or not in 50 years we're not going to have these problems you know we're not going to have in 50 years time people driving you know cars in 50 years time we're still going to have people punching each other we're still going to have people you know fighting each other um we're still going to have people stealing stuff but road traffic offenses as time progresses technology and um if you like the way that we deal with offenses we'll see less and less of them there's no two ways so it's a short in the in Policing terms, it's a very short term investment. Um, so it's not the thing you're going to look at going on and on and on. 
The other thing we need is standardisation. And this is the one thing that really gets me as a police officer is that I live in Staffordshire. Um, and if I report in Staff an offence in Staffordshire, it's dealt in a very different manner to if I report an, an offence in West Mids. I'm a central motorway police officer. If I drive up the M6 and cross a boundary line, the threshold change regards speeding. I can do somebody for doing a lot less speed in Staffordshire than I can in West Midlands. You can't have that when it comes to a justice system. Um, you can't have people being offended against in one part of the country being dealt with in a different way to another part of the country because if, if you do that, of the sorts or sexual offences or anything else you know people will be up in arms what happens with road justice I, I, I to this day I still don't know um, but there's got to be some kind of standardisation um, but moving that forward the only way that's going to happen is if you have a national road policing unit the same way you have British Transport Police um, you know and everybody the same rules apply everywhere regards actioning what is actioned when you get the third party report and the way it's disposed of because you know there's stuff coming into west midlands that would get a course a fine or sent to court then in other parts of the country they'll get a warning letter now you you can't have that you just you just can't have that at all we need that standardization um, and we the police across the country have got to recognize the importance of third party reporting Invest the prioritise um, in third party reporting is widespread now, but you just don't hear about it in the press. You know, we don't, you know, it's not put out there. If drivers knew the scale of third party reporting, who's been caught for what, under what circumstances, you'd have more people reporting, you'd have more people changing their behaviour because they think they're recourt. And the actual system would get more priority as a result. It would probably overtake, you know, the kind of traffic policing that I do on a day-to-day -day basis because it's much easier to do. It's a lot cheaper. It costs a lot of money to train a person like me. It takes five years to take to just to train a, a traffic officer. That's without the initial training as a police officer to the required standard. That's what they say. And you know, the courses cost tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Horrible thing to say, third party reporting, is it traffic policing on the on the chief? Yes. Is it the most effective form of traffic policing probably we're going to see going forward? Probably yes, again. So that's why, you know, and I've centred on feedback today as the one thing that, you know, is the hardest part of the process, but it's probably the most vital part of the process if in the future it's going to reach its full potential because without thanking the people and, you know, um, getting people who report um, to improve the product that they give us, that product being the evidence, if you like. I'm not into vigilante policing in any way whatsoever, but genuine victims who carry, you know, cameras who witness offences or, you know, are offended against by drivers, I am very much in favour of because that's what the system's there for. Um, many, many years ago, when we first started being Steve, we did have somebody come down to the West Mids who I would call a um, a tourist, if you like. He lived in a completely different part of the country, I heard that we were doing this regards to third party reporting, came down on the train, rode his bike about and wanted people to offend against him and started riding in a manner that probably encouraged offences against him. Um, and that's the kind of thing, you know, that... that puts people off but the genuine victims the genuine people who want to make their societies a, a safer place when it comes to those people who offend on the road um, that's what the system's there for and so by using the feedback system um, and by improving it improving the process and like I said the process is there you know 95% of it's there it's only the feedback process that needs to be informed we'll probably have what I would call, what we've been looking for, the golden chalice of road policing, because it's 24 seven, everywhere, all the time, and just puts that doubt in every driver's mind before they offend. Won't stop them all, because we know what they like, um, but generally it will stop 95%. Um, and that's me done.